I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Um, hello and welcome to All Things Policy. So we have with us. Uh, I'm Bharat Reddy, and we have with us uh, Satya and uh, uh, Vishnu Raji. Uh, Satya is a researcher at the Takshila Institution on uh, working in the high tech geopolitics vertical, and uh, Vishnu is an investment principal at the VC firm Special Invest. He focuses on uh, deep tech and climate tech startups. Um, so what we'll be talking about today is related to India's investment in research and development. It's only about 0.6 percentage of the GDP. And this is quite low when you compare it with other countries. So, and what's more alarming is that only 37% of this comes from the private sector. And when we compare it to other countries, like China has invested around 2.4 percentage of their GDP in R&D, and many other developing developed countries do more than 2% of their GDP into R&D. Um, so India's research and development is below par, um, to say the least, right? And the this is even more stark when it comes to deep tech um, uh, startups. So the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor recently released a deep tech startup policy, and the aim of this is that is to drive innovation, economic growth, societal development through the utilization of advanced research based on deep tech inventions. So. Uh, as we can see private sector r&d is very low and uh, deep tech faces additional challenges in um in you know coming to uh, the market or you know the investment cycle itself for the development process and all of these things so it'll be good to understand this um, um, ecosystem a little better and we have with us vishnu who's a who studies this space uh, very deeply um, so welcome vishnu it's nice to have you here and uh, to get started with uh, can you tell us what is deep tech from your perspective and how is it different from other areas um, that you work on absolutely thank you so much satya for having me over uh, it's always a pleasure when uh, you know i read takshashila because i have been a student of takshashila or i was part of the gcpp uh, program second cohort so long 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 association it takshashila is also my inspiration to pursue my second masters in public administration from harvard so the everything started from there in 2012 so i owe a lot to uh, takshashila institution in many senses i've been off touch with you guys for the for a long period of time now uh, but i'm glad that we could reconnect uh, personally and at an institutional level through this uh, podcast so really really appreciate that perhaps i could give you a little bit of background about special itself and uh, you know also before we jump into that special is a, a early stage deep tech fund uh, we typically invest in pre seed and seed stage companies so directly after uh, the laboratory or like you know at a pre revenue stage uh and we primarily invest in a lot of deep tech companies we'll get to the point of like uh, to answer your question what does deep tech means uh our investments are in space technology companies we have the largest space tech portfolio in the country uh we also invest across climate tech which includes mobility energy uh manufacturing uh industry uh, and so on and then there is a vertical on industry tech we call semiconductor supplied electronics robotics and so on and then there is another vertical of life sciences and biosciences uh and then a uh, fifth one would be generative ai synthetic data a little more software side of deep tech that's who we are and that's the kind of investments uh, we make coming back to your question on uh, what is deep tech it's a very relative it's relatively a much much newer term i would say that it came into existence uh in 2013 14 15 types not before that the phrase was at least not in use obviously uh, what we call as deep tech today existed then and even before that uh and what 
we have seen is that uh, the phrase deep tech kind of gave a terminology to club a lot of these uh, the you know uh, technologies that couldn't be classified under generally under you know oh technology saas software as a service or under consumer etc there were multiple types of uh, industries and products we kind of got but they they share a certain characteristic and that got clubbed under deep tech generally speaking when we speak about deep tech we refer to companies which are uh, building a technology product uh which has heavy basis on science and engineering so it is not a pure software product it is not a a product which is about a platform and you know you can just quickly scale up or anything it is a product where uh some amount of research and science has definitely gone into um and and time immemorial immemorial like we, this thing has happened across the world this is not the first time like the whole all industrial revolutions have always been except the recent one where digitalization was just upon it has always been hardware and science based stuff so it's kind of like the circle comes back uh, it, it, cyclically it is becoming a uh, better a newer kind of rev, uh, you know uh, product i mean newer just version of the older hardware products i would say uh generally speaking deep tech uh, startups when an investors perspective or generally uh, you know uh, from a startup uh, ecosystem perspective it holds slightly higher risk than the you know typical products that we do actually i would say that it pro- it, it has risks which are different than what the current startups face so typically when when venture capital as such is a, as a financial class is very very risky that's why you know you take equity for it you can you know you see that uh, the value of equity that people ask in a venture capital investment is quite high compared to any other investment any other typical any other solution in 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 particular so we usually look at when when we make venture capital investment there would be a slight technology risk with the product development etc there would be a market risk uh, there would be a sector risk etc uh but then when it comes to uh deep tech investments or startups the highest possible risk comes from the technology side of things and when i say technology side of things at least at my stage which is the early stage we usually see two types of risk one is at the science science risk science risk is very 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 uh, like i mean it's it's the, it's very self explanatory like you know the scientific part is not resolved yet like the there is a there is an original thinking that has gone into it and there is a part of that science that probably needs to be proven either at a lab scale or at at, at least at a commercial prototype scale and then there is an engineering risk as well engineering risk again comes stems from the fact that we not only have to produce a lab prototype most of the time these are hardware products you have to come to a stage where there is a commercial prototype and then a commercial scalable uh, product also needs to be built in. so uh, so that's the primary risk typically uh, the vcs are the regular vcs are not equipped to deal with this kind of risk like they don't they don't usually look into these kind of risk but that being said uh, newer versions of like you know, deep, deep tech vcs are emerging so you will you will see more and more of my kind emerging and uh, doing this work uh yeah that's an overall about what deep tech is multiple sectors come in the sectors that i mentioned for specia this usually like covers a large chunk of the type of uh, uh you know uh, sectors that work so space tech the whole ambit of climate under that mobility energy transition uh agricultural technologies biotechnologies circularity uh, the whole ambit of like carbon capture decarbonization uh, industrial uh, and infrastructure building as in physical infrastructure all of these needs like deep tech products to bring in innovation uh, applied electronics robotics all of that yeah it's so from a from a vc perspective um, so you've spoken about the different kinds of risk and the risks are not just uh, uh, more but there are also different kinds of risks 
um, so as a VC, when you approach yes. investing in a deep tech startup, is there a, um, what what else are the considerations? Is there a longer term or um, a time horizon because it's still an experimental technology that has to be proven? Uh, what are the other factors you would consider um, that you would not for uh, for a, say another different kind of a startup? So I'm guessing the knowledge of the technology itself is one thing, but uh, other than that, uh, what other considerations go into it? That's an excellent question. Anyway, like you know, uh, for a deep tech startup, see the for any startup, the risks that each investor considers at various stages. So what we call as like seed. Series A, Series B, the risk, risk, the expected risk or the risk that that particular kind of investor is ready to under, right, changes at each stages. And that is, that is applicable for deep tech as well. So when I come in, let, let, let's say that I am the first institutional check, I'm the seed investor. At this stage, the kind of risk that I am willing to underwrite, I mean, it's more of a sequential manner, but like, I mean, I want to underwrite are first the technology risk. I need to have like, I definitely need to have like a, an excellent technology, like some, some sort of uh, IP surrounding it, intellectual property surrounding it. You need, need they may have patented it, may not have patented it, could also be a trade secret, but there needs to be something which brings in a technology mod that will uniquely differentiate that product from whatever is available in the market. So a disruptive technology, that's definitely one. Second is uh, the market. When I want to invest in a deep tech startup, I am not going to look into a market which is less than $1 billion. It needs to be a huge opportunity, like the market potential, so, so when I say market potential, like see, uh, 2008, nine when people were investing in Uber, I'm pretty sure nobody would have imagined the size of the ride-sharing market or the size of you know Airbnb's potential market would be this big. But you know, uh, you still could visualize something, and that's why some VCs invested in that. Uh, deep tech markets are usually very direct. You don't have to visualize a lot of markets. It's usually like very direct markets. But that being said, that like, I mean, it's very difficult if I can't visualize a large enough market, at least a couple of million dollars in a few years time, I would not enter that space. And that's a way for me to mitigate that risk. Like if the, te the technology risk is already high and if I can't even get like large market share, I can't even see revenue potential over there. So there, there are sectors or like technologies which do not get funded as deep tech because of this, but very crucial technology sometimes. You just can't commercialize it. And then the third factor for me at my stage is the team. The team holds a lot of weightage. I would want both of the founders to be technologically capable, uh, smart. Uh, I also want to have like a good mix of complementary skill sets, one being one who can lead the whole technology science side of things and then the other operations, business, etc. I mean, it could be split between three founders, four founders. Ideally, we prefer more not to have single founders because it's just too tough to build a company and then one person doing all of that would be very tough. But at least two people, but complementary skill sets and very, very, uh, you know, the pally between them, the rapport between them, working relationship needs to be really good. These are the three, three risks I primarily consider. Uh, a stage later, the engineering risk becomes more important. Have they completely solved the science risk? Is the, what is the scalability challenges? What's the commercial scale? The CDC, you would say, right? Like, are there pilots being implemented? Is there a good enough business model that you can test in the, uh, uh, you know, in the space? And CDC, series B, those are the things people will consider. Once you have your commercial prototype done, you have a couple of sales done, then to be honest, like, you know, the risk that is associated with a deep tech product is actually not, it's very comparable to any other startup at a series C, series D level. Once you have to solve the first two things, it's more about traditionally, how do you scale a business? Uh, how do you scale, uh, solve the challenges of commercialization and scaling up? That becomes the most important thing. Or how do you work around the ma ma macro and the market risk? So I would say that, yeah, the early stages, the risks are slightly different, but once the once such that differentiated risks are resolved, mitigated to a large extent, uh, it it becomes any other business. Um, so to jump in here, uh, you mentioned one, a, a very specific point about finding these startups or finding these founders 
who pitch it to you. Um, now, this relates mostly to the, to the R&D side of things. Um, I presume a lot of the technology that is involved in um, deep tech startups are uh, usually at least um, are formulated during in an university or an incubator setup by an university or industry uh, nexus. How do you how how does the pathway from there to a funded deep tech startup look like from a from your perspective? I assume you have a, a good bird side view. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. So, so, so uh, fundamentally, uh, uh, you are right. A lot of these things will have to come out of universities and uh, you know centers of excellence for research, etc. That is being in the country. Fundamental research needs to happen. But some of the companies that we have funded also comes uh, not need not necessarily come out of uh, universities but like you know two phd's meet by chance or by design they meet they decide that hey i have an interesting idea let's pursue that and they just use their scientific temperament to develop a product we have an example in our portfolio actually cut many examples but one uh, coming to mind quickly is new trace new trace is a green hydrogen membraneless electrolyzer startup green hydrogen is very high in the industry, they are the first funded green hydrogen, institutionally funded green hydrogen startup from India. They are one of the handful of uh, startups in the world which has a commercially demonstrated membraneless electrolyzer for green hydrogen. So it's out of Bangalore. Uh, there are two PhDs returned from Europe. Uh, and then one of them you did some work around laminar flow and what they are doing with, currently doing to own green hydrogen as a part of the PhD thesis. But then uh, tried multiple other kind of uh, startups in SaaS, etc., and realized their comfort zone is in deep tech and came back and started working on this particular thing. So that also happens. But that being said, you are right. Globally, if you look at deep tech and in matured market, right? Like you are Europe and um, America are like much matured markets for deep tech. Uh, and then a lot of it comes from uh, universities. They have a mechanism to actually commercialized from universities. We are still at a very, very nascent stage for that. The policy definitely will help in that direction or put it put. That's proposed a lot of good good suggestions to do that push, to create that push to commercialize things. From an investor's perspective, to answer the question, how do you find these things? It's constant engagement, man. Like So, uh, like we have very, very close partnership with IIT Madras. Uh, IIT Madras has been a pioneering institution in deep tech uh, startups in India. Um, and some of those pioneering, like Agnipul Cosmos in Space Tech or E-Plane Company, which is an air taxi company, all of them spun out of IIT Madras, uh, either professors or students who are utilizing the facility over the Aether, all of them came out of IIT Madras. So uh, we have invested in some of them. We have very close contacts with the people uh, over there. So we kind of like uh, get to see all of that. With other institutions, we, call, we, we are creating that kind of relationship um, and you know, work with those uh, uh, people over there, the incubation centers, the professors. Sometimes the professors don't want to go to the incubation center. They kind of try to do it on their own. So how do I reach out to them? Um, like if from my part, say uh, on Monday, I'm going to IIT Hyderabad for uh, uh, their demo day. But I mean, it's just a four hour event, but I'm going for two days, ensuring that I get to meet all the professors in uh, working over there. They have a center, you know, center for semiconductors. So I want to go and meet, see what, what is happening, not just from a commercialization perspective, right? Like we, we constantly keep track of, or at least try to keep track of what sort of researchers I have, research are happening in these institutions. IIT Delhi, we did a deep tech mixer uh, around the policy along with principal uh, scientific advisors office and uh, as you know partnering with iit delhi uh, uh, technology transfer office uh, in delhi like you know we have good contacts with them similarly with iit bombay uh, we have two startups from run by professors in the country, like one from IIT Madras, E-Plane is uh, Dr. Satya Chakravarti's startup. It's an air taxi company. Uh, and then there is InSpecity, uh, Professor Arindrajit Chaudhary from uh, IIT Bombay. He uh, InSpecity works on afterlife of satellites, extending that and creating constellation of satellites to uh, do more work with after, at the afterlife of satellites. Uh, and there are many companies in our portfolio which are spun out of the universities as well. So for us, it is 
constantly being in touch with some of the best institutions, uh, best places where uh, the research is happening, where the innovation is happening. Uh, Bispilani, IT Rukki. Um, earlier, there used to be this thing that, it, you know, these kind of, uh, this kind of innovation so really comes out of IITs. That is not the case anymore. Uh, SRM, VIT, NITs uh, in Bangalore, uh, uh, the two engineering colleges over here, I, PES and RMB. Uh, uh, I am not sure of the name. Yes. Uh, RB, RB and, yeah. So both of them have like many founders coming out of there. So that's that's a large part of it. I also want to point out a, a trend. This is about like, I mean, researchers and all of that. See, uh, five, even five years ago, if you wanted to start a startup in India, if you don't know coding, there was no startup. Like software used to be like the basic component backbone for a startup. And nobody could even imagine raising VC money if you didn't know uh, software. That has changed. A lot of the folks who have gone into industries uh, who are in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, are realizing that they are sitting on this wealth of knowledge on manufacturing and skill sets that they have learned from how they have commercialized. They can come back and they can start thinking about starting up. A lot of them are doing that. A lot of them are partnering with uh, their friends in universities who have been doing cutting edge research. See, think about this, right? Like, I mean, somebody with cutting edge research mindset from a university partnering with someone who can scale products, hardware products, who have manufactured it. So it's a completely different skill set that has not been utilized. I mean, they were, most of them are like in the multinational companies or like, you know, working with Tata or ITC or, you know, some of those companies have good skill sets, but really, really like stagnated, didn't know where to go. All of a sudden in the last three, four years, they have an opportunity to do something bring the best example is mobility a lot of people from mobility companies like the traditional auto industries have just jumped out and started doing things it could be components it could be uh you know uh, a new vehicle itself a lot of them are doing so so there is that's that we should not uh, see think it is only at the university scale there is there is immense amount of talent in the corporates as well and they are also coming back. They are also seeing a way to start a business. Also. It's, a, it's a huge opportunity. So just um, drawing on that, um, I, the sense I get from this is the discoverability of R&D or intellectual property or basically ideas um, is being primarily industry led, like led by VC firms like yours. Um, is, there, is there any other institutional mechanism through which that you feel or you have seen in your experience where discoverability of the R&D, like this knowledge base, this skill sets, etc., cetera, uh, is being uh, like showcased to industry who can then scale it up or something like that. Like you mentioned that your firm does this. Do you know of any other institutional mechanism or uh, a trend? So, so, so venture capital is definitely one of the institutional mechanisms, right? Like, I mean, the early stage VCs, there are quite few of us. Uh, so specialist one, uh, capital to be uh, influx or high ventures. Uh, these are some of the firms which are trying to focus on uh, deep tech at various stages. Uh, very few as early as us. Uh, most of them come at a slightly later stage. We don't mind taking even the uh, what we call as a TRL3 level, technology readiness level. So NASA has a scale of TRL1 to TRL9, 10 where, you know, from lab lab idea to commercial protos, prototype stage. So TRL3, TRL4 is like very, very lab scale uh, stuff. So we don't mind putting money at those uh, stages either. Uh, most VCs, even in deep tech, have more comfort if you have, people are at TRL5, 6 stages, where you at least have some sort of commercial prototype or a scaled prototype and not a lab scale. So, so definitely VCs are one place. We need to have a lot of specialists in the world, uh, in India, to scale this up. But there are there are multiple ways in which you can discover or support these startups at very early stage. See, there's a whole part of where academia needs to be linked with industry to start developing even products which are industry linked. 
that linkages to industry is very very limited in india currently so the professors and the, the the researchers and the industries industry leaders needs to have this constant feedback loop of like industry going and funding grant based funding to develop some of these technologies as well as just putting it out there these are some of the problems that they are suffering and in you know providing the impetus or incentivize the researchers to take it up so that feedback loop mechanism needs to be there so idea wise that's one way to ensure that we have constant ideas which are useful and commercial commercializable uh, but there are also a lot of ideas which are there in the university sitting over there one way to do that is to technology transfer officers or incubation cells as you call it a lot of the folks in a lot of the institutions in the country and the, uh, the policy also mentions this, like of cre- if you, if they are not there creation of such technology transfer uh, organizations so either they help in if some of the technologies which are just sitting or not every researcher wants to be a business owner uh so uh, they are just good not good at it and some of them know that very well and that's okay i mean that's not their core skill set they are really good at what they are doing that's why they have some commercializable uh, technologies in there uh, so one way is using these technology transfer units and license out the technologies to people who can take it up and scale up that's one way uh, another way is like helping the researchers to be the business owners as well right? like the professors i mentioned who can now who are now running a company thinking about the commercial uh, potential building that 0 to 1 and the 1 to 10 journey they can actually take forward on that by themselves that's probably one of the way so and um, there is another uh, so the accelerator incubators are also that like you know if somebody has an idea you can come go to them or to those places and get at least support ecosystem support in like making sure that uh they have a path to commercialization they can think about commercialization the one under explored idea in india and even to be to be very honest uh even in the western countries it's still it's still maturing is the the concept called venture studio venture studios are in my own words i would say they are think of them as institutional co- uh, co-founders so if if you have so they would take an equity slightly larger than at seed stage vc they might give like some capital but at the same time as an institution they will have a lot of skills that they can bring on to the table on from the business side connections uh you know introductions partnerships your first customer how do you set up a manufacturing plan what are the just just simple uh, what are the regulations that you need to navigate all of these wealth of knowledge and skill sets they can bring as an institution and that has some good uh, so 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 a technology founder can probably partner with these venture studios and then find another founder they can kind of like develop that Uh, concept it could be that model there could also be models like entrepreneur of the store and where they just provide the space for founders to meet each other so and then ideas get sparked so uh, there could be that talent based solution or an institutional co founder kind of thing as well both 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 models are still getting explored in india huge opportunity uh, to do that uh, in deep tech uh, one of the um, example that i often cite is this venture studio biosciences based venture studio in boston uh, called flagship pioneering they usually get ideas from universities their team type kind of try to they, they form a team which will try to build and commercialize this thing and if it works out they will help the team to spun spin out of uh, flagship pioneering and establish themselves as their own companies uh one of the very very famous impactful company that came out of flagship pioneering is moderna uh moderna uh, the covid vaccine creator right so they came out of such a venture uh, studio so i would say that's that's one of the great examples so venture studio incubators working with uh, early stage vcs these are some of the ways in which you can discover the issues right Stay tuned to All Things Policy. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Uh 
Um, so yeah, so we've looked at the different challenges the deep tech startups face. And now before we get into uh, the deep tech startup policy itself, um, Vishnu, can you tell us a little bit about um, whether there are any, whether there's a case for government intervention uh, in the sense that are there any market failures that exist? Uh, do you see that there's, there's a um, lack of information um, visibility, for example, asymmetric information or um, any other kind of market failures that you see? Or is there a case to uh, for the government or uh, to intervene because this has, is it kind of uh, acts as a foundation for a, a lot of other uh, innovations which are built on top of it. Um, so any from any of these kind of lenses, do you see that there's a case for uh, governments to intervene to uh, build a robust uh, deep tech ecosystem in the country? Uh, th- that's a very interesting question, uh, Bharat. So uh, see, well, think about all the sectors that I mentioned under deep tech, right? Like mobility, energy transition, or uh, space tech, or you know, uh, manufacturing, uh, agriculture, building constructions, or uh, you know, robotics, drone technologies. All of these we are, we are hearing about, or like it, keep AI to the side for a bit. Even, but to be honest, even AI, all of these. What do we see? One factor that is common in all of these is the research and scientific aspect is there. But if you actually look into the larger sectors in this piece, all of these are heavily regulated industries, pharma, life sciences, biosciences. So so inherently, the policy already plays a role in these industries as regulators. They have regulations in place or there are policy directions in place. The startups will have to come back, you know, like, like allude to and operate within the confines of these things. Uh, from a government intervention, and so you, you said government intervention and not necessarily just policy. So I thought I'll, I'll uh, and, and when is government interventions required? When there are inefficiencies that the markets can't solve for itself, right? That's what market failures. Is. So there are inefficiencies in the market. I mean, to be honest, like the whole venture instrument of, so the all financial, uh, the, the financial instrument of VC itself is a, uh, solving market uh, failure in some sense if you go to the origins of it like you know there is if you have a new idea there is no way to fund it the capital only uh, re- used to reward highly uh, risk free assets the debt capital that was uh, available the riskier investments need equity and that equity how risky can you go that's that, that's where we are pushing the envelope right so there, the venture in, venture capital itself is like some sort of mechanism that created to solve market failure that's just my argument i'm not saying that you know it's a universally accepted thing but that's how i think about it coming back to deep tech so let's think about it in two different ways financial and non financial from a financial angle if you look into it very early stages of development uh, early stages of research there is there is heavy risk involved like you start working there are there, i know folks who work on nuclear fusion in india who has demonstrated capabilities presented papers and very cutting edge research doing it uh, and trying to do that thing nuclear fusion is still very risky there are few companies in the west which has to at least try to you know commercialize it but it's still at a very very risky stage so the question becomes like how much risk can the private sector bear and if the risk profile of any technology goes beyond that threshold you will not private capital will not invest in it will not put the money and that's where government can step in so the com- so the stuff which i was saying about technology readiness levels probably from 1 to 3 or 4 it has to be uh, funded through grants non dilutive capital that non dilutive capital can come from government can come from philanthropy, uh, can come from corporates making uh, grants and awards uh, in that direction. But it has to be non-dilutive capital. And non-dilutive capital, uh, a lot of non-dilutive capital can come, has to come from government. I wanted to take an example of US that my mind went a little ahead and said US, but uh, I wanted to take this example from the United States, right? So National Science Foundation, they have immense amount of capital available. You, uh, 
they, people make projects that it's not awarded as startups or like companies, but project proposals get uh, money awarded in that. Department of Energy, DOE awards so many uh, uh, research grants. There are like multiple organizations in the US which actually works towards just doing fundamental research. We have very few cap money co capital going in that direction, to be honest. Um, we are trying to be more smart about we are also a poor country like you know the, there is a limitation to which we can actually put cap you know support these things we do have uh, we do have a lot of grants uh, meti the you know electronics ministry BIRAC, which is a biotechnology ministry etc gives uh, large sums of capital and uh, we actually see that the Aftermath of that as well. Biotechnology companies in India are exemplary. The extent of them, some of them are at very early stages. Uh, we will start seeing some of them growing up in the next few, uh, you know, five, three to six years. But we have exemplary research and tech companies that are being built from India. A lot of them survive on government grants. Indian researchers are much more thrifty and do with the minimum amount they get compared to what Fox in the US, etc. get. But it's still there is capital coming in from that. We can we need to increase at manifold levels if we aspire to be the industrialized nation that we want to be by 2047, right? Like uh, this, this capital needs to grow in. That's where the innovation needs to happen. And this can vary also. Like, I mean, even at... Uh, a seed equity funded startup still might need some grant money because there is science that no you know part of the projects can be funded by uh, non uh, private capital without diluting much so the various stages you need that instrument to happen and government will government has to play a good role we are smart in the sense that you know government uh, government is coming with provisions to use csr the 2% uh, for scientific research as well, which is a good initiative. Uh, in US, uh, there is this organization called Activate.org. Activate, what they do is uh, they they re recruit uh, PhDs uh, or postdocs uh, to come with some technology and they give like some 120K per year as stipend to these folks, two years and provide access to um, labs at MIT, UC Berkeley, and all of that, and say that, hey, commercialize your technology. Take it from lab and build the commercial prototype in two years. And there is like, uh, th those people have like a respectable income coming out of the stipend, and there is people trying to do that. So that's definitely one way to government intervention is required uh, and can be done. There's a lot of like, you know, Bits Pilani coming up with a PhD program where instead of a thesis, build a startup. Uh, so we, we, are, we are the VC partners to them. But like, I mean, it's a great approach. We, we should try all of that and see what works for us. Uh, so, but that's a financial side of things. The government can definitely play a role over there. On the non-financial side, it's actually creating that ecosystem, which will help these uh, companies uh, grow from a direct uh Direct policy intervention perspective, as I said, these are very regulated sectors. The government can play a role uh, to create founder-friendly, sorry, invest, uh, startup-friendly, technology-friendly regulations. Universally, we know policy always lacks technology. But then how much can we catch up? We don't expect them to catch up on like, you know, uh, as technology evolves, but can you speed up that process? Um, RBI has done this experiment in fintech on sandbox approach. So basically, they work with few uh, startups and create these sandboxes, uh, as in like you know controlled experiments, you can say, and see what is the effect of a particular technology working. Government successfully did that to create the drone technologies in India. Like you know, work with few drone startups to finalize the drone policies. Uh, one way to go about it, AI is coming in the ethics of AI, etc. Very, very much on the policy side of things. We, we don't have any regulations over here. So government needs to work with the startups rather than retroactively just making and just getting suggestions. Battery swapping uh, policy was suggested two, three years back. Even I gave my uh, suggestion for to Niti Ayo, but they never tested it. And the policy is still in papers. Like, I mean, it was just getting suggestions, but it's also important to like create these sandboxes, see what is the, you know, how does the policy 
help a startup or you know what the reaction to that policy would be etc so creating that uh, founder startup friendly policies is one place government can do it there is a way to navigate the existing regulations support for that government needs to come and do it and this is probably for more from a investor perspective but like you know we have a huge restriction on where the capital can flow in to india go outside etc there needs to be a little bit more leniency in that given the fact that we need we are capital strapped and uh, you know we need to have every capital every form of capital coming in i mean you can tighten the regulations after a few years but like at least for the that current period we need to have more capital flowing into uh, these industries and it should also be easy for founders to go outside as well uh, we we are not making it easy on founders to sell abroad by staying here ultimately it's becoming like because of all the regulations people are just uh, flipping to us and then going over there because capital is there and customers are there we don't want that to happen we need to make it as friendly as possible so that founders can sit here raise capital from anywhere in the world you know uh, sell it to anywhere in the world that that kind of like friendliness needs to come and la- last what i would also say is on the exit side of things a lot of the deep tech startups uh, while you had uh, connection issues uh, you know satya and we were t- discussing that uh, you know a lot of the exits are going to come in the form of acquisitions uh, by large corporates we will not we will not see the number of unicorns that we see currently Uh, you know represented in the deep tech side of things a lot of deep tech companies will get acquired uh, before they get to the unicorn status there would be great acquisitions like 500 million 600 million good value created but they would it's likely that they will get acquired like globally europe america we see that quite often indian mncs are warming up to it foreign mncs are also coming and you know carefully following startup the deep tech startup ecosystem in india polco shell bp all of them have corporate venture capital presence in india It's very very closely following what the ecosystem is building and investing as well so those acquisitions will be the exit routes wealth creation money to sir capital to sir cycle back and come to the industry and those are not something which the government has not addressed yet uh, if you look into the policy or the suggestions in general the government do a lot of the things on the early stage rightfully so what i said like providing capital establishing like you know technology transfer centers strengthening the ip laws etc but at the same time we also need to look at the tail end of the thing i mean we have a couple of years in our hand because these the startups which are coming now can have to grow up and you know do it but how do you facilitate that kind of acquisition process is much more easier are these existing laws supportive to startup acquisitions i mean we do we don't even have done a realistic reflection or to just take stock of what the situation is i think that is also important but yeah few ways in which government intervention is required and that will help us right so i had a question uh, when you talk about the not not hurdles but the challenges in in terms of encouraging this the deep tech startup system specifically uh, what kind of in your experience have you challenges have you faced when it comes to uh looking at a revamped sort of intellectual property policy when it comes to deep tech because the uh, as far as in a lot of patents a lot of um, like previous work on on which a lot of deep tech can be based on is either owned by private um, entities or by the government now would, do you think there is a case to be re- to be made for revamping india's intellectual po- property policies um, laws or is there any other way out or, or is this not a place for government intervention at this point uh from like if you actually look into india's patent laws etc right uh, most of the patent uh, uh, laws in india are very much in line with the uh, wipo uh, world intellectual yeah. property organizations uh, laws patents copyrights etc very very in line with the international standards honestly for me i don't think uh, we need to i don't think we need to revamp the policies as such but there is a lot that can be done on the implementation side if there is a policy breach like uh, sorry sorry a uh, patent breach uh, who will i go to how long is going to how what how complicated is this process is can i easily like seek redemption is there a 
quick grievance re- uh, you know uh, addressal mechanism in place that those are the things that are more important like i mean if somebody steals my uh, patent or intellectual property and if i get resolution after 15 years there is nothing i need to uh, do over here market is over the time is over etc especially semiconductor and all like you know new new innovations keep coming in so you need to uh, do so strengthening the implementation and addressing the grievances uh, quickly would be something which i would strongly encourage that india should do it uh, but also aware of the fact that historically developing countries always had weaker intellectual property rights like i mean uh, china has for the like uh, it's the competition that used to help Uh, like people are just replicating everything you can't just go and sue everything and just be in a, like you can't, we, first of all we are not a litigation economy or a litigation kind of society uh, so uh, there would be like so many pushback from us as a from a societal level as well but that be, that also being like i mean us in the 1920s 30s they have copy uh, you know they have been like copy making copycats of like their tech, uh, stuff that are being made in elsewhere and trying to build their economy japan did it in the 50s 60s and 70s korea did it in the 70s and the 80s china did it for a much longer period uh, and all of the company all of those countries moved out of that period of ip infringement and like you know started getting better at it uh, so it is good to have ip protection uh, the laws are strong i believe the implementation is weak but at the same time i also see why the government wants to spend their don't want to spend their energy over there and focus on other areas uh, right now almost all my companies while they have filed for patent and multiple patents in pct through pct through to multiple country patents uh, they, their strategy is usually to innovate constantly and get ahead of the people who are trying to compete rather than uh, you know uh, just say that hey this is my ip and nobody can even touch it it's just it's we just don't have it so people are just you, uh, you know thriving on thriving on their innovation capabilities over intellectual property Did that answer your question? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Just to just add add on to this, the the reason I asked that question is because as we're beginning to see um, countries around the world advocate for resiliency in very strategic technologies, and a lot of those technologies do involve deep tech, semiconductor development, clean energy, climate change stuff, um, all and battery technology, all of that. Um, the because so usually I assume in the future near future or so. countries would want the ip to remain uh, within like indigenous hands is, is is what i would assume maybe it's not a great way for the marketplace to function i don't know i don't know whether this can be implemented in any way uh, but yeah like we are seeing this so i i am not exactly sure what you meant but ip usually it means i mean uh, it's just that if ip infringement happens even domestically how do you get a grievance mechanism right like how can you act Oh, I I don't I didn't necessarily mean an infringement. It meant in terms of um, is the con is the is the state going to necessarily mandate uh, uh, against the transfer or acquisition of a company by a foreign company, etc. Which uh, will will because of the signature. I cannot see. I I can't help but think those will be very very counterproductive ways uh, if you start. preventing ip thing you can say you know rest have the manufacturing etc located here i would rather incentivize that come you know acquire to still stay in india uh, it would just only if 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 you start like a lot of the times the acquisition is for the intellectual property from deep tech uh, side so right. if you are if you're going to prevent that it's just going to be counterproductive like you know we didn't we won't have as much capital or exits that will happen if see acquisitions won't happen if we investors are not going to get their money back if investors don't get their money back there is no capital recycled and coming back into the ecosystem 
if if i get an exit i become more audacious i become more emboldened and risky uh, you know i will take much higher risk in my next cycle of investment that's how it works it's you have to push the envelope edge with each cycle so uh, putting artificial restrictions on uh, because i mean there are strategic areas or security related areas we may have to do that but uh, generally speaking uh, it would be counterproductive as my sense that makes sense to me us also we just have been seeing a lot of like you know this kind of counterproductive thinking in in uh, strategic circles simply because of the nature of the technology being involved but yeah well time will will we'll see how it pans yeah. out well, over to you bharat uh, so vishnu you you spoke a little bit about the regulatory uncertainty that's involved uh, in this uh, uh, development process right uh, so is there something that people working in deep tech can do to uh, bring about this um, you know um, help the government understand the technology better um build i mean uh, for the policy to catch up to the technology so is there some role that the industry or the academia can play to bridge that gap uh, what do you see uh, could be some the sandboxing approach that i mentioned which rpi tried and even non regulation uh, before that they tried it is mentioned in the detect policy draft also like you know uh, uh, i've been following that for some time and i think that's a great way to do it across the world people have been trying and testing it uh, i think we should have easier playbooks uh, to get that implemented perhaps even like uh, think tanks like yours uh, and other think tanks can also take this initiative to facilitate it right like at the end of the day it ha- it is an controlled experiment uh, the government does not have the right incentives or mechanism to do that controlled experiments and the private sector also needs to be incentivized enough to come and participate in it so a third party role is crucial in doing that who unders- who can understand government as well as Uh, as well as uh, uh, the startup of the technology ecosystem, and at the same time, does not have vested interest in either. So, creating and or- uh, orchestrating that uh, could be like a mechanism that can be developed. And how how do you do that often? So, we, uh, I think that's definitely one. Um, having constant dialogue with government, industry, and the start- technology ecosystem the startup ecosystem is something which needs to be facilitated and uh, the envelope of that conversations needs to be pushed uh, into more actionable items so this conversations could be round tables like you know uh, dialogues uh, between people uh, it it needs to be constantly facilitated and uh, we need to also track how this happens so i would say that we do that a lot of that but if it's not moving into tangible benefits it's not kind of like uh, good right so which is why alternative mechanisms like the sandboxing one or like uh, regularly taking feedback on a policy like on the deep tech policy itself uh, i believe the uh, psa's office has done a fabulous job on like going around the country getting a lot of people on board to get inputs and see what it is what needs to be done but um that feedback creating that feedback loop is super super important and uh, i am pretty sure like the uh, startups and the technology people would be very very happy to work with kernel because we know the troubles of like uh, government acting retroactively right like i mean government coming 2 3 years later and just undoing a lot of stuff which they themselves allowed to go on and then uh, repurposing it we see that in fintech we see that in uh, you know many other sectors uh, at least in deep tech and all i would rather have them come along with the journey uh, and we would always be happy to facilitate interactions with our policy our portfolio companies or in general as such right um so uh, as we come to a close uh, Uh, you've already spoken about a lot of the um, areas about the deep tech uh, policy itself so any final thoughts about the policy itself and uh, what are your uh, um, you know the your uh, expectations for this policy when it's rolled out and how do you see the future of the deep tech industry in india it's an, it's an uh, excellent first step uh, in uh, you know i would say uh, 
I'm usually not such so liberal with my words when it comes to uh, acknowledging policies, but I think it's a brilliant first step uh, to create this policy. The government, I would say that the government in India uh, actually uh, outsmarted the industry, the uh, uh, corporates in India to get it. It's usually the startups, then the corporates, and then finally the government following. But here, they definitely outsmarted uh, the corporate because corporates are still warming up to the Indian deep tech ecosystem. So uh, it, it gives impetus for every other stakeholder to warm up to this idea, get their act together and start acting. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to see how that will shape up. But uh, I want to stress on the uh, operator word first step. Uh, we need to constantly revisit this uh, policy. Uh, I think every two years we should have a reflective session, see what additions needs to be done, how can we make it better, uh, can things be, are there counterproductive things, are there things which can be added to it. Uh, see, it's a, we have, uh, this policy is heavily lauded on the discovery and the early stages of the idea and uh, promoting that. But can we also like think about the later stages in two years time we will see a lot of these startups maturing into uh, bigger established businesses so how do we still uh, support them and put them to this path of like industrializing the uh, nation so uh, that's how i what i think about the deep tech policy as such about the sector in general I, dude i mean my job is interesting because i get to see like this very very early stage nascent ideas no things which not everybody gets uh, i like you know to see on a daily basis i have never been so positive about what's happening in india one thing you know at the scale the like everybody is talking about funding winter and you know capital not available etc i don't have time to eat also so i have my hands full in terms of the number of i mean uh, companies that are coming to me in deep tech spaces i can't be more optimistic about what's happening in the deep tech space uh, uh, at least in the startup world and the kind of technology innovations that are happening Some, sometimes just like you know when i hear an idea i am like I know this won't work, but the extent of imagination that people have opened up uh, or thought about it and decided that I will come and see. And we need that kind of thinkers, right? People who will be like thinking at like scale, at scales and like, like completely out of the box or like destroying the box itself. Uh, and those kind of innovations are happening in India. And that is brilliant uh we are we, we, i i'm 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 very very i'm not, i don't want to throw numbers and market size or anything but like uh, the sheer sheer number of sheer volume of startups that early stage startups that i'm seeing in my pipeline is enough to keep me so excited uh, to uh, be here at this point and that's a nice positive note to end on so uh, thanks vishnu this has been a very very in- insightful conversation we've got a, a window into your line of work into the deep tech uh, industry itself and how the government thinks about this so thank you so much for that and we hope to have more such conversations with you in the future um, so thank you and uh, have a nice day yeah yeah you too have a nice weekend guys bye if you liked our show Don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashila inst. और आवर वेबसाइट तक्षशिला.org.in